Alhamdulillah, you're a little bit of a Sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Emma Ba'at, the author states, may Allah preserve him, getting back to the first line of this poem, where Shaykh al-Islam is responding to the questioner inquiring about his madhab and creed. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah's madhab, school of jurisprudence, was initially Hanbali, as he studied with his father and grandfather, Abu Barakat Mejduddin, who was from the major scholars of the Hanbali madhab. After mastering the Hanbali madhab, he left studying and following one particular madhab, and would give religious verdicts, fatwa, with text, Quran and ahadith, instead of opinions of the particular madhahib. After time, he had reached a level of ijtihad and mastering of the different opinions of the scholars, as well as their methodologies in deriving rulings and verdicts from the proofs. So he would issue verdicts with the strongest proofs and evidences in his view without sticking to one specific madhab. So this was his madhab in jurisprudence. As for his madhab in creed. So he had basically two madhabs. His initial madhab that he grew up upon was the Hanbali madhab. Then after studying and studying and diving and delving into the different sciences and mastering fiqh and mastering tafsir and mastering hadith and mastering even other branches of secular knowledge as well, then his opinion later on was a mujtahid. He was a mujtahid and he would give what his view was the most preponderant opinion from all of the different madhabs and views and jurisprudence opinions existed in that time. As for his madhab and creed, then it was the madhab of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his companions, and the tabi'een, no. salaf al-salih, righteous predecessors. So, we talked earlier about the word madhab. So madhab can also be used to refer to as a methodology in understanding creed as well. No. He elaborated on his creed in many of his books, especially in his book Al-Aqidah al-Wasitiyah, where he said, quote, This is the creed of the saved and victorious group until the establishment of the hour, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the people and united community of the prophetic tradition. End quote. The creed of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is the original creed and ideology that the Prophet mentioned when he said, The Jews split into 71 sects, one of which will be in paradise and 70 in hell. The Christians split into 72 sects, 71 of which will be in hell and one in paradise. I swear by the one whose hand is it, I swear by the one whose hand is, is the soul of Muhammad, my nation will split into 73 sects, one of which will be in paradise and 72 in hell. It was said, O messenger of Allah, who are they? He said, the main body. In another narration, it is mentioned that when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was asked, who are they? He said, what I am upon and my companions. There was only one madhab in creed for the main body of Muslims during the time of the Prophet وسلم, and his companions, which is the creed that Shaykh al-Islam mentions here in this poem. During the, during the time of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, there did not exist other madhahib in creed. The creed of the main body of Muslims was one, not many. There was no such thing as the creed of the Shia, Khawarij, Murji'a, Mu'tazila, Jahmiya, Asha'ira, Maturidiya, Sufiya, uh, the Tablighiya, Ikhwaniya, Tijaniya, Naqshbandiya, uh, Buroi, I can never say that. I can't say that. Etc. Do we need to stop there? I think all of you guys have these different sects mentioned in your notes, inshallah, that we sent in the group, inshallah. And if you have any questions, inshallah, about them, inshallah, we can inshallah, try to address them towards the end of the lecture. But this is clear, I'm sure, to everybody, inshallah. Yeah, of course, political sects that have a whole bunch of ideologies no, within them. No. Allahu Akbar. Sheikh Zahid, pronounce it. Relevi. Say it again. Relevi. 
Bareli. See, it's the it's the V then. It's the V. Yeah, yeah. It's the V. So the V is pronounced as a W, right? It's the, between no. a V and a W. No. Mm -hmm. All these sects and their set of new beliefs and concepts were non-existent at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions. Any time a new belief, doubt, misconception, act of worship emerged during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions, they would immediately denounce it and warn their community from it. Any time someone wanted to introduce a new type of worship, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would immediately advise them. The great companion, Anas ibn Malik reported that some of the companions of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked his wives about the acts that he performed in private. Someone among them, among his companions said, I will not marry women. Someone among them said, I will not eat meat. And someone among them said, I will not lie down in bed. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praised Allah and glorified him and said, what has happened to these people? that they say so-and-so, whereas I observe prayer at night sometimes and sleep sometimes too. I fast sometimes and I eat sometimes. I also marry women. And he who turns away from my sunnah, then he is not from me, not one of my followers. In Sahih al-Bukhari, it mentions, a group of three men came to the houses of the wives of the Prophet wasallam, asking how the Prophet wasallam worshipped, worshipped Allah. And when they were informed about that, they considered their worship insufficient and said, We are we from the Prophet wasallam, as his past and future sins have been forgiven. Then one of them said, I will offer the prayer throughout the night forever. The other said, I will fast throughout the year and will not break my fast. The third said, I will keep away from women and will not marry forever. Allah's Messenger wasallam, came to them and said, are you the same people who said so and so? By Allah, I am more submissive to Allah and more afraid of him than you. Yet I fast and break my fast. I sleep and I also marry women. So he who does not follow my tradition and religion is not from me, not one of my followers. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam immediately warned his companions about the emergence of an individual who from his loins would emerge the Khawarij. It was narrated that Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, when Ali was in Yemen, he sent some gold to the Prophet wasallam, who distributed it among Al-Aqra ibn, ibn Habis. No, ibn Habis, Habis al-Handali, no. who belonged to Bini, Bini Mujasha. Uyayna ibn Badr al-Fazari. Al Al-Qama Ibn Ulatha al-Amiri who belonged to Bin Kalab and Zayd al-Khalil al-Ta'i who belonged to Bin Nabhan. These are all different tribes. These are all different Bedouin tribes who were there during the time of the Prophet Muhammad The Quraysh and the Ansar became angry and said, He gives to the chiefs of Najd and ignores us. He said, I am seeking to win them over to incline them to accept Islam. That a man with sunken eyes, a, bul a bulging forehead, a thick beard, and a shaven head came and said, O Muhammad, fear Allah. He said, who will obey Allah if I do not? He trusts me with the people of this earth, but you do not trust me? A man among the people asked for permission to kill him, but he did not let him do that. When the man went away, he, the Prophet Sallallahu said, among the offspring of this man, there will be people who will recite the Quran, but it will not go beyond their throats, and they will go out of Islam as an arrow goes through the target. They will kill the Muslims and leave the idol worshippers alone. If I live to see them, I will kill them as the killing of Ad. Even the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after his death would denounce newly emerging ideologies and practices. When the ideas of the Qadariya emerged and reached Abdullah ibn Umar, how did he react? Yahya ibn Ya'mar mentioned, accidentally we came across Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab while he was entering the mosque. My companion and I surrounded him. One of us stood on his right and the other stood on his left. 
I expected that my companion would authorize me to speak. I therefore said, Abu Abdurrahman, there have appeared some people in our land who recite the Quran and pursue knowledge. And then after talking about their affairs, added, they, such people, claim that there is no such thing as divine decree, as qadr, no. qadr, and events are not predestined. He said, Abdullah ibn Umar, when you happen to meet such people, tell them that I have nothing to do with them and they have nothing to do with me. And verily, they are in no way responsible for my belief. Abdullah ibn Umar swore by him, the Lord, and said, if any one of them who does not believe in the divine decree had with him gold equal to the bulk of the mountain, Uhud, and spent it in the way of Allah, Allah would not accept it unless he affirmed his faith in divine decree, Qadr. Another example of what occurred during the time of the companions that shows us how dangerous it is to invent new beliefs or acts of worship and proves to us that small innovations lead to larger innovations. Salama uh, al-Hamdani reported, we used to sit by the door of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, before dawn prayer. When he came out, we would walk with him to the mosque. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari came to us and he said to him, O oh Abu Abdurrahman, I recently saw something in the mosque that I detested and yet, praise be to Allah, I saw nothing but good. Ibn Mas'ud said, what was it? Abu Musa said, if you wait long enough, you will see it. I saw people sitting in the mosque in circles waiting for prayer. A man in each circle had pebbles and he would tell them to say, Allahu Akbar, exalt Allah 100 times and they would do so. Then declare, there is no God but Allah. Say, la ilaha illallah 100 times and they would do so. Then glorify Allah. Say subhanallah 100 times and they would do so. Ibn Mas'ud said, what did you say to them? Abu Musa said, I did not say anything to them. I was waiting for your opinion or order. Ibn Mas'ud said, would you not order them to count their sins and guarantee for them that their good deeds would not be wasted? We went along with him until he reached one of these circles and he stood over it saying, what is this I see you doing? They said, O oh, Abu Abdurrahman, they are pebbles by which we count the exaltation of Allah, declaration of his oneness and his glorification. Ibn Mas'ud said, count your sins, for I guarantee that none of your deeds will be wasted. That, uh, for Ibn Mas'ud said, count your sins, for I guarantee that none of your good deeds will be wasted. Woe to you, nation of Muhammad, how quickly do you run to your destruction? Here are his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Numerous around you. These are the Prophet Muhammad's clothes, yet to fade, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. These are his utensils, yet to break, by the one whose hand is my soul. Perhaps you are upon a religion better guided than the religion of Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Or have you opened the door of misguidance? They said, by Allah, O oh, Abu Abdurrahman, we intended nothing but good. Ibn Mas'ud said, how many intend good but are not right? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informed us that people will recite the Quran and it would not reach beyond their throats. But Allah, I do not know that perhaps many of them are among you. Then he turned away from them. Uh, then he turned away from them. Amr ibn Salama said, we saw most of them in these circles attacking us on the day of Nahrawan with the Khawarij. There were, What's the point there of mentioning that narration? How small innovations, bid'ah idafiyah, something which in its usul it is permissible. Dhikr is permissible, right? You can make dhikr any you want. Allah says, Udhkarullah kathir, and make a lot of dhikr. But we have specific rewards that are mentioned with different types of dhikr as well. Make 33, Allah Akbar, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, after each prayer, you get the reward of this and this, okay? But when somebody comes and says, do this on a specific day which Allah didn't specify, or do this in a, a, a number or an amount that Allah didn't specify, when you take a general act of worship that Allah didn't specify a certain date or time and you come along and specify it, 
this is what is called bid'ah idhafiya. Okay, so you see the small bid'ah, the innovation of the man sitting in the circle and telling, say Allah Akbar a hundred times, say Alhamdulillah a hundred times, say SubhanAllah a hundred times, led those same people who were sitting in the masjid making dhikr to be the ones who were with the khawarij fighting against Ali ibn Abi Talib and considering him an apostate. No. There were those who had doubts, misconceptions from among the hypocrites and those who were ignorant about the true creed who had emerged as individuals such as Dhul Khuwaisara whom the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that the Khawarij would emerge from his loins. However, they did not emerge as a sect with their own set of beliefs in ideology until the time that Ali ibn Abi Talib was the Caliph in Iraq. After the Khawarij had rebelled and assassinated Uthman ibn Affan in al-Medina, they then overthrew those who were in charge in al-Medina and took the city over. Many of those present in Medina migrated to Iraq to be under the leadership of Ali ibn Abi Talib, while some remained behind. Ali ibn Abi Talib wanted to find those who assassinated Uthman ibn Affan immediately, but he did not want to cause more fitna amongst the ummah. So he delayed for some time and waited for things to calm down. However, while waiting for things to calm down, some of those very same Khawarij who were living in Iraq inside a confusion between some of the companions, between the camp of Ali ibn Abi Talib and the camp of Aisha. In support of Ali, we find that the Shia emerged. Shia, which means supporters or helpers, they were initially just showing resistance to those who opposed the Caliph Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Khawarij. However, many were led astray and started introducing new beliefs and going to extremes in their beliefs about Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then the ideology of the Murji'ah emerged in opposition to the Khawarij, who were considering anyone who fell into a major sin to be a disbeliever. The Murji'ah considered anyone who fell into a major sin or any type of sin to still have complete Iman and that his Iman is not affected at all with bad deeds. They believed that actions have no relationship to Iman at all. When people started to debate about whether actions were from Iman or not, and the ruling upon someone who commits a major sin, the Khawarij said that one who commits a major sin is a disbeliever, while the Murji'ah considered the one who committed a major sin to have perfect Iman, and it didn't affect his Iman at all. The result of such foreign ideologies gave birth to the emergence of another sect called the Mu'tazila, who agree with the Khawarij in their view about someone who commits a major sin, except they added on a, an, additional, added an additional statement, except they added an, in additional an additional statement, statement no. saying that the one who commits the major sin is in an in intermediate position, Barzakh, or manzila bayna manzilatain, as they say. Between two positions, between two positions. Between the hellfire, in paradise or between being a believer and between being a disbeliever. He is not called a believer, nor is he called a disbeliever, until many other misguided ideologies and opinions were introduced into the ummah. Then in the later generation of the tabi'een, the statement of the Qur'an being created emerged, and negation of Allah's attributes, and the distortion of the meaning of Allah's rising above, al istiwa The first one to introduce these statements was al jat ibn Dirham al-Harani, 118 Hijri, and uh, Jaham ibn Safwan al samarqandi 128 Hijri, who the Jahmiya sect is ascribed to. Once the Greek books of philosophy were translated into Arabic, many of these newly innovative sects were affected by philosophical principles, which led them to give precedence to their human logic and intellect over textual evidences from Allah contained in the Quran and Sunnah. They slowly strayed away from the main body of Muslims and formed their own sects with their own teachers, principles, ideologies, and methodologies. They eventually started to spread the statements of the Jahmiyyah started to and increase started. and right yeah. they eventually started to spread the statements of the Jahmiyyah and started to increase and spread even more then Bisher 
Ibn Ghayyab al-Mirisi al-Baghdadi to 18 Hijri emerged and aided the statement of, and aided the statement and madhab of the Jahmiyyah. Then Abdullah ibn Sa'id ibn Kulab al-Basri to 43 Hijri emerged who refuted the Jahmiyyah in their statement about the Quran being created and introduced a new statement claiming that the speech of Allah is speech that is within Allah's essence alone and that Allah does not speak in all reality when he wants with what he wants. Then Abu Ali al Jubbai. al Jubbai. Then Abu Ali al Jubbai al Hanafi, 303 Hijri, emerged in al Basra, who was the leader of the Mu'tazila and the teacher of Abu Hassan al Ash'ari. 324 Hijri. Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, he continued upon the madhab of the Mu'tazila for about 40 years of his life. Then he repented and left that ideology and began to refute the Mu'tazila. However, he now adopted the statement of Ibn Kullab about the speech of Allah being only in Allah's essence and not having certain traits and attributes. Abu Hassan al Ashiri's statements and beliefs became widespread in Al Basra and Baghdad, Iraq. Then many of those who ascribed to the Shafi'i and Maliki madhabs in fiqh spread his teachings as well in Sham and Northern Africa until Abu Mansur al Maturidi, 333 Hijri, emerged in Samarkand whom the Maturidi sect is ascribed to, and whom many of the Hanafis ascribed to following in creed. Ibn Taymiyyah said, Al-Ash'ari was a student of the Mu'tazili the scholars, and then repented. He was a student of, uh, he was a student of Al-Jabba'i, and developed an inclination towards the views of Ibn Kullab. He learned Usul hadith from Zakiriya Asaji in Basra. Then, when he came to Baghdad, he learned other topics from the Hanbalis of Baghdad. That was toward the end of his life, as he himself and his companions mentioned in their books. Most of the later generation Ash'aris do not adhere to the madhab of Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari after he repented. Rather, they are influenced by many of the principles of the Jahmiyyah and Mu'tazila and even of the philosophers and they differ with Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari regarding many of his views. Many of them deny the divine attributes of Allah rising over the throne, istiwa, being exalted, coming down to the lowest heaven in the last third of the night, the hand, the eye, the foot, and speech. Regarding all these divine attributes, they differ with Al Ashari himself. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, Many sects and groups from the people of innovations and desires have ascribed themselves to the four Imams in the subsidiary issues of fiqh. While these great Imams are free from those who claim they are their followers, this is well known, as there were many people from the Jahmiyyah, Qadiriyyah, and the Mu'tazila who all ascribe themselves to Imam Abu Hanifa and his school of thought in the subsidiary issues of fiqh. While Imam Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf, Muhammad ibn Hassan al shaybani and the rest of his immediate students were completely in opposition to their views and the creed of the Mu'tazila. And their statements regarding this is well known. Even to the extent that Imam Abu Hanifa said, may Allah curse uh, Amanu ibn Ubaid who opened up the doors Father? Oh, here the door. yeah. may Allah curse Amanu ibn Ubaid who opened up the doors for people to speak such false things he goes on to mention in addition to that the great student of Imam Abu Hanifa Abu Yusuf al-Qadi wanted to punish Bishr al-Mirisi when he started to talk about distortion 
and negation, ta'til, of Allah's names and attributes until they made him flee from the city. These scholars, scholars of fiqh. these scholars of fiqh, Imam Abu Hanifa, his contemporaries, as well as his students continue to boycott, rebuke, and refute the Mu'tazila and the other misguided people of innovations and desires. Bishr al-Marisi, who was the leader of the Jahmiya, and Ahmed ibn Abi Du'ad, who was the judge at that time, all used to ascribe themselves to Imam Abu Hanifa's madhab and school of thought regarding jurisprudence issues. Imam Abu Hanifa and his students were known to rebut and refute those who wanted to introduce new beliefs and ideologies into the deen. Imam Abu Hanifa himself was mentioned to refute one of the biggest misconceptions that many who ascribe to Abu Hanifa, uh, to, to the Hanafi madhab today have, that Allah is everywhere. Imam Abu Hanifa said, whoever says, I don't know whether Allah is in the sky or not, has disbelieved. We hope to see those who ascribe themselves to the Hanafi madhab in the 21st century and beyond following that great example. So who are Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah? The word Ahlu means people, family. The word Sunnah, according to the scholars of Aqidah, means all Muslims who consider the four counters in their rightly in their in their right order. In their right order. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali. It also means the opposite of bid'ah, innovations. Well, jama'ah means the main body or congregation of Muslims. Anyone who affirms the caliphs in that order are considered Sunni Muslims. Anyone who denies or changes this order of the four caliphs are considered Shia Muslims. Everyone from Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah is a Sunni Muslim. However, not every Sunni Muslim is from Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah in the specific usage. Many Sunni Muslims who established the correct order of the four caliphs strayed away from the main body of Muslims, introduced new ideologies, beliefs, and practices that were foreign to the pure Islam of the main body of Muslims during the time of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his companions. Some of these Sunni sects denied the reality of Allah's names and attributes and interpreted them to be only figurative or abstract. Many Sunni Muslims left the main congregation of Muslims and went on their own with newly invented and innovative beliefs and practices that their leaders invented for them, such as the Asha'ira, Mu'tazila, Khawarij, Murji'a, Jahmiya, different sects of the Sufiya, and we're going to roll the dice again. Brave what? No, almost. Brave. Say that. No, you say it, say it, say it. Let me hear you say it again. I can, I can say Brelvi. I can say that. Brelvia, I guess. I, I can't mix the V into the Arabic. It's, it's a thing. Right? Okay. The, but I, the, I still can't. You all know what I'm saying. But I really, Naqshabandiya, Tijaniya, and other Sunni sects as well. The phrase Ahlu Sunnah may be used. One, to describe all sects that oppose the law of law Shia in a general sense. This description is similar in meaning to a Sunni Muslim. This usage was more popular in the earlier generations. Two, in contrast to the people of Bid'ah, innovation, in this case, what is meant is the people of the Sunnah in the true sense. That only includes those who adhere to sound belief of the main body of Muslims and what the Prophet ﷺ was upon and his companions. Namely, the Salaf al-Salih and Ahlul Hadith. In this case, the phrase does not include those who have adopted creed of the Jahmiya, the Mu'tazila, the Ash'aris, the uh, Maturidis, the Khawarij, the Shia, the Murji'a, the Sufis, or others who mix their theological principles, Ilmu Kalam, with innovative principles, beliefs, intellectual reasoning, because they differ with Ahlul Sunnah 
regarding many fundamental principles and issues. They added on to the Deen of Islam beliefs, actions, and statements that are foreign to it. This is the more specific meaning. Later, the Ash'iris were Jebris regarding the divine decree, Murji'a regarding faith. They denied the divine attributes and did not affirm any of them except seven because they could be proven rationally or so they claimed. They denied Allah's rising above the throne, Istiwa, his being exalted above his creation. And they said, he is neither within nor without the universe, neither above it nor below it. And there were other differences too. So how can we call them Ahlul Sunnah? Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, the phrase Ahlul Sunnah refers to those who affirm the legitimacy of the first three caliphs. That includes all groups except the Rafidis. It may also mean the scholars of Hadith and Sunnah in the true sense of the word. That only includes those who affirm the attributes of Allah, may he be exalted. Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen said, the term Ahl Sunnah includes the Mu'tazila, includes the Ash'aris, and includes those followers of innovation whose innovation does not go as far as disbelief. Kofar. Pay attention right here. If we use the term to mean as opposed to the Rafidis, to the Shia. Does that make sense? As we mentioned in page 86, okay? So there were two usages that were used to describe who Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah is. When you are talking about Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah in contrast to the Rafi, then all the sects fall under it and it has the synonym of Sunni Muslim. But when you use the specific usage of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, then the only group that is included <coughs> is the main body of Muslims and those who were upon what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was upon and his companions. Now, but if we want to explain the meaning of the phrase Ahlul Sunnah, we say that Ahlul Sunnah in the true sense of the word are the righteous forebearers. Forebearers. Mm, forebearers. forebearers. Asad al-Saleh, who united in their adherence to the Sunnah and followed it. In this case, the Ash'aris, Mu'tazila, Jahmis, and so on, are not among Ahlul Sunnah according to this meaning, in quote Ibn Uthaymeen. So yes, the main body of Muslims that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was referring to in the hadith is the Jama'ah of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. The Muslims during his time did not need to identify as something other than Muslims because they were all upon one creed and set of beliefs. However, when new beliefs and sects started to emerge after that, it was necessary to distinguish between them, those that remained upon the correct creed and those who strayed. Those that remained upon the original creed and set of beliefs were known as Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah, Ahlul Hadith, Saved Sect, Victorious Sect, Main Body of Muslims. This was the creed of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, and this is what he is mentioning here in this poem as he elaborated upon as he elaborated upon in his many books of Aqeedah, such as an Aqeedah al-Wasitiyya, al-Risala, al-Tadmuriyya, al-Hamawiyya, al-Kubra, Kitab al-Iman, and many other compilations clarifying the creed of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah while refuting the innovative sects and their false ideologies bravely. Bravely. Yes. Closer. Uh, still off. Tell you. Father Isha. Sunnah refers to those who affirm the legitimacy of the first three caliphs. Why three caliphs only? Which page? Yeah, it just said. The second line. Towards the top. Shaykh al Sam ibn Taymiyyah said the phrase Ahl al Sunnah refers to those who affirm the legitimacy of the first three caliphs. The issues with Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Rafida didn't consider the legitimacy of the first three caliphs. They gave Ali precedence oh. over Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman. Now,
No. So, so re really, what he's saying is that he's saying that the Shia don't accept the fourth. Not that the fourth should not be accepted. Mm -hmm. They say they don't Ali accept the first. The first one. That's the they say Ali should be the first one. Period. Mm -hmm. yeah. The first three shouldn't have took place. That Ali should have been the first. First. No, and that's it. No. No. Okay. No. okay. <laughs> okay. Then Shaykh al Islam goes on to say, Ruzik al Huda min li hidayati yes alu. The one who asks for guidance will be given it. Commentary. In the first line of poetry, Shaykh al Islam is making supplication for, and the one asking. For the one. Okay, for the one. In the first line of, the, of poetry, Shaykh al Islam is making supplication for the one asking about his madhab and creed. Because this is a good indication for a Muslim that he is inquiring about two of the most important issues in one's life. If a Muslim is guided to the straight path, this is the best type of, sust of, of sustenance and provisions that a Muslim can ask for. The Muslim asks Allah for guidance at least 17 times a day in his daily prayers by reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. The wisdom behind this is that Allah keeps the servant upon the straight path continuously and does not stray. And the servant realizes that he is in constant need of Allah's guidance throughout the day and the night. Ruziqa means to be given or provided with. The word risk means sustenance or provisions. Risk is what Allah decreed and gives his creation from all things they can benefit from. Allah is responsible for providing risk for his creatures, for his, for his creatures, Muslims, non-Muslims, plants, animals, insects, birds, fish, and even unseen creatures. However, the risk that Allah provides the believer is different than that of the rest of the creation. Allah promised the believers wholesome and pure risk if the believer abides by Allah's commandments and laws. The disbeliever will receive provisions, but they will be void of blessings and better cat. Similarly, the Muslim who is involved in impermissible jobs or selling products that are haram or doing business while lying, stealing, cheating, and dealing with usury, riba, will also be devoid of blessings. The one who lacks knowledge of his or her creator works strenuously to attain provisions, believing that it is his or her hard work, intelligence, and efforts alone that cause these provisions to come to him or her. As for the believer, then he has firm belief, reliance, and dependence upon Allah, his creator, that Allah already decreed for him his sustenance and provisions. So the believer takes the necessary means which include sincerity, trust, reliance, dependence upon Allah, consuming only the halal, performing one's job with precision, honesty, accuracy, and professionalism, to seek provisions, but does not believe or think that his sustenance is based solely upon the means and his own efforts. There are two types of risk. A, the type that the believer strives for via business, farming, trading, etc. It takes effort and action. B, the type that comes to the believer automatically, without effort, such as inheritance, gifts, and charity. Many perceive risk to be restricted to wealth or money, which is deficient. Actually, risk and its types are numerous, and it revolves around all things that are beneficial to the creation in this world and the next. Risk is also beneficial knowledge of the deen, having wisdom, having good health, safety, and protection. Risk can be a righteous spouse, righteous children, gaining the love of the people. Risk can be success to pray, the night prayer, to memorize the Quran, to die as a martyr, or even someone accepting Islam because of you. Some tips on how to go about in search of one's risk. A, always take the proper Islamically legislated means to seek wholesome, halal provisions, permissible jobs, careers, professions that do not involve anything impermissible. B, have strong faith in Allah that our risk has already been decreed 
while striving, working hard, and continuously depending upon the fact that whatever was not written for us to attain, we will not attain. And whatever was written for us to acquire will come to us. C, avoiding sins and disobedience of Allah. D, maintaining ties with family and relatives. E, giving charity. In this line of the poem, Shaykh al-Islam is supplicating for the one who is inquiring about his deen to be given great provisions, which the greatest of all is guidance to the straight path and the correct creed and madhab. Al-Huda literally means guidance. It also means Islam in success. We find it used in many places in the Quran and the Sunnah to mean true Iman, following the messengers and prophets. The types of guidance that Allah gives human beings is four types. A, guidance that is general for all creatures within their natural instincts, fitrah, and DNA. All creatures are born with, such as knowing they need to eat, drink, sleep, propagate when danger is close, and the guidance to know what to do in those situations, fight or flight. They differ according to how much their natural instincts, fitrah, have been corrupted or not. B, guidance that Allah has placed upon the tongues of his messengers and prophets, which they relate to other human beings. This guidance is contained within the books of Revelation, the Sunnah, and the Wisdom. Sending the different revelations to the people, and they responded to the message and followed their messengers. The final message being the Quran and Sunnah. C, success that only gives to those who respond to his messenger's calling. No. Say it again. Success that only Allah gives. Success that only Allah gives to those who respond to his messenger's calling. Okay, that makes sense. D. Guidance in the hereafter to enter the paradise. So whoever asks about proper guidance or inquires about the correct madhab and the correct creed should ask Allah first and foremost through supplication and dua while having patience and continuously being obedient to Allah. Then immediately afterwards, ask the trustworthy scholars. Whoever does this will be granted the guidance to the truth and granted the path to learn from the trustworthy scholars to aid him and assist him. Text. Then he goes on to say, Isma' kalam muhaqqiqan fi qawlihi la yanthani anhu wa la yatabaddalu Listen to the speech of one, an expert in his statement, without changing it nor replacing it. Commentary. In this line of poetry, Shaykh al-Islam is encouraging the questioner and all of those who want to learn about his madhab and creed to listen attentively. He may have started this line of poetry with the command to listen because in that time, many of the students would read to their scholars and other times the scholars would read to them. Similarly, the sense of hearing, listening, is achieved by the ears. A person who has no control, a person has no control, uh, a person has no control over what sounds go into his ears unless he puts earplugs in or his fingers or blocks his ears. Contrary to the sense of sight, where one could close his or her eyes just by blinking one's eyes, many times, the positive or negative emotions, feelings, and thoughts that enter the mind, soul, and heart are from what one heard via the ears. Scholars have mentioned that the sense of listening is one of the first senses that develop inside the womb. As the fetus can hear before it can see, it hears its mother and father and can recognize their voices before seeing their faces. Even in the Quran, we find that Allah mentions the sense of hearing before the sense of sight in many verses. Due to its importance and developing first, Allah knows best. Some of those verses, if you guys want to go home and research that and look it up even more, Surah An-Nahl, Surah An-Nahl, inshallah, in second edition, we'll put that in the foot, foot, footnotes, inshallah. Surah An-Nahl, verse number 78. Surah Al-Insan, verse number 2. Surah Al-Isra, verse number 36. And these are from the miracles of the Quran. Uh, verse number two, no. Al Insan, verse number two, and Surah Al Isra, verse number 36. 
Listening attentively is one of the most important steps in learning. It is from Allah's wisdom that he has given human beings two ears and one mouth. One could derive from that, one could, could, one could derive from this that, one should listen more than one speaks. When starting to learn and seek knowledge, one should observe with their eyes and listen with their ears more than speaking. What enters via the ears enters the heart, mind, and soul. If one is listening to something positive, beneficial, and good, then it affects the individual in a positive manner. If one is listening to something negative, music, lying, backbiting, vain speech, then it will be found then then it will be found to negatively affect that person's behavior. This may be the reason as to when we investigate many of the biographies of the Salaf al-Salih, righteous predecessors, we find that some of them would put their fingers in their ears to avoid listening to sounds that would harm their hearts. Narrated Abdullah ibn Umar, Nafi said, Ibn Umar heard a flute being played, so he put his fingers in his ears and went away from the road. He said to me, are you hearing anything? I said, no. He said, he then took his fingers out of his ears and said, I was with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he heard like this and he did like this. Listening attentively is one of the most important steps in learning and acquiring beneficial knowledge. Abdullah Ibn Mubarak said, the first stage in learning is a sincere intention. Al-ikhlas. Then listening attentively. Al-istima. Then understanding. Al-fahm. Then memorization. al -hif. Then action upon it. Then al-amal. Then sharing it. Al-da'wa wa nashr Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi said something similar as well. The first stage in learning is listening attentively. Then memorization, then action, then sharing it. Sufyan Authority said the same thing as well. The first stage in learning is remaining silent, then listening attentively, then memorization, then acting upon it, then sharing it, then teaching it. Knowledge is acquired through six different levels and stages. A, asking a good question. B, observing silence and listening attentively. C, having good comprehension. D, memorization. E, teaching. F, action upon it, which are its fruits, while being conscious of its boundaries. When observing those who seek knowledge, we find that there are people who are prevented from learning because they do not ask questions or know how to ask the proper questions. There are others who are prevented from learning because they do not know how to remain still or remain silent and listen attentively. Debating, arguing, and expressing their weak opinions based upon little or no knowledge is more beloved to them than remaining silent and absorbing what the learned scholar is conveying to him. This is an illness that is found in many students of knowledge that prevents them from acquiring large amounts of knowledge, even if their comprehension is good, especially in the 21st century. Some of the righteous predecessors used to say, whoever has good comprehension while having poor listening skills, his good traits will not outdo the bad trait of poor listening. Abdullah ibn Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal mentioned, Urwa ibn Zubair used to love to debate and argue with Abdullah ibn Abbas. So as a result, Abdullah would not teach him everything he knew. As for Ubaidullah ibn Abdullah ibn Utbah, then he would kindly and gently ask Abdullah ibn Abbas questions, and he would benefit him with the treasures of knowledge. Ibn Taymiyyah ordered the questioner to listen attentively and carefully. Isma. A sama is one of the ways that the Quran and Sunnah are learned, conveyed, and passed down generation after generation. So, in the line of poetry, after making supplication for the questioner in the first line of poetry, here he wants the questioner to pay attention to the answer of one who knows what he is talking about and is a specialist in the subjects that the questioner inquired about. Muhaqqiq 
A muhaqqiq is someone who is an expert in his field or in many fields. A muhaqqiq is one who knows the truth about the issue at hand, which with 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 with, with certainty, based upon extensive research, while he understands the intricate details and specifics about the subject. He can distinguish between right, right and wrong, good from the bad, and the beneficial from the harmful. Tahqiq is the highest level of reading, reciting Quran and in research as well. Tahqiq amongst the scholar, amongst scholars, the scholars no. amongst the scholars of jurisprudence normally means to establish and answer questions with clear, decisive proofs and evidences. In this line of poetry, Shaykh al-Islam is telling the questioner to listen carefully because he is going to respond with clear evidences and proofs that will remove any and all doubts one may have and clarify the strongest view in these issues that the questioner inquired about, madhab and creed. Fi qawlihi. Literally, this is translated to mean in his statements. However, in Islamic sciences, whether fiqh, aqidah, tafsir, usul, and many other branches of Islamic knowledge, the statement also means his view or his opinion on a certain issue. We can derive from this that Shaykh al-Islam's statement and view are the same in this issue. وَلَا يَنْثَنِي anhu. He will not change, retract, or alter his statements regarding these things because they are based upon Qur'an and Sunnah, which have no room for changes or alterations. A Muslim should understand that their creed is from Allah and it can never be changed or altered, no matter who comes along and tries. In this line of poetry, Shaykh al-Islam is letting the questioner know that his creed will never change and he will remain strong and firm upon the creed of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, the creed of the Salaf al Salih, righteous predecessors. Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah never change their views in any issue related to creed because their creed is directly from Allah. It is pure revelation. It is pure revelation contained in the Quran and authentic ahadith. The same creed and beliefs that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had before leaving this world is the same creed that companions had and is the same creed that every true believer should have after him and is the creed that the true adherents to the madhab of Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah strive to practice. Whoever tries to change or introduce new beliefs into Islam has indeed chosen a dangerous, pa a dangerous path that will eventually lead one far, far astray. As for one's jurisprudence or legal, or legal school of thought, madhab, then there's no problem if one initially studies one particular school of thought, then changes one's madhab from Hanafi to Maliki, or Maliki to Hanbali, or Shafi'i to Hanafi, or even chooses some views from another madhab to be stronger and closer to the evidences. If one finds that the proofs and evidences of another madhab that he is not studying, or following is stronger, clearer, and has been agreed upon by the ummah or abrogated another text that the madhab he was that, uh, that the madhab he was following. Then it is more beloved and actually, according to some scholars, obligatory for that individual to follow the strongest proofs that have come to him, as Allah says in the Quran and Surah Az Zumar, verse fifty-five, and follow the best of what has been revealed to you from your Lord before a severe punishment comes to you while you are heedless and inattentive. Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah said, if an individual follows Abu Hanifa or Malik or Shafi'i or Ahmed and viewed that in some issues that the madhab of another imam is stronger and then he chooses to follow the other view, then indeed he has done something good and that does not harm him in his religion, nor his piety, without a doubt. Rather, this is closer to the truth, and more beloved to Allah and his messenger, the one who is bigoted... Then, then one. Rather, this is closer to the truth, and more beloved to Allah and his messenger, than one 
who is bigoted and fanatical and follows only one specific person other than the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, like those who are bigoted to the four Imams and view that this specific person's statements are correct which should be followed and do not follow the statements of the Imam who has an opposing view or conflicting statement. Whoever does this, then indeed he is ignorant and misguided. Rather, he could be a disbeliever. For verily, whenever he believes that it is obligatory upon the people to follow a specific person from amongst the scholars while disregarding the other scholars, then indeed he must seek repentance from Allah. And if he does not, then he should be killed. Indeed, it is permissible, and one should, or it could, be obligatory upon the layman to follow someone, but without specifying this person or that person. As for someone saying, it is obligatory upon the layman to follow this person or that person, then this is something that a Muslim doesn't say. Mm. And just a short commentary on that right there. Um, so, the principle, Al-Muqallid, Al-Muqallid, Yalzim At-Taqlid. Al-Muqallid, Yalzim At-Taqlid. If somebody is a layman and I'm learning a madhab, I'm learning with a particular sheikh, and I consider myself a muqallid, I have to follow that sheikh. I have to follow that sheikh because I don't have any way to understand the religion except through him. So I follow his way, I follow his fiqh, I follow his jurisprudence, rulings and views and opinions. That muqallid yalzamahu at-taqlid. He cannot force other people, other laymen to follow that madhab that he is following from his shaykh. So that's a very important point and this goes for all issues of fiqh, all issues of ijtihad, all issues of jahwa ta'deel as well. Okay, so a muqallid cannot force anyone to take the opinion that he is following of his sheikh. Very important. No. So if one embarks upon studying and following a certain madhab in jurisprudence, then they should not only study and follow that madhab in jurisprudence, but even more importantly, in creed as well. They should take the great example of those great imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmed, and rebut those who ascribed innovative beliefs and creed to the four madhahib, as those great imams did themselves. None of the four imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmed, were ever Mu'tazili, Jahmi, Ash'ari, Maturidi, Dayubandi, uh, Burewi, almost, Burewi, Naqshabandi, keep going, right? Just just flow. Naqshabandi, Tijani, Sufi, Tabligi, Ikhwani, or the likes of these newly invented sects and creeds. They would have surely denounced these ideas and creeds. The creed of the four Imams never changed. Their statements can be found in their compilations and the early books of the Madahib. As for their statements and jurisprudence, Fiqh, then they themselves advise their students and followers to take where we took from Quran and Sunnah. And I could say something today and recant my statement tomorrow. And we know that Imam Shafi'i had an early madhab and a later madhab. Several of his views and jurisprudence issues changed based upon his increase in knowledge and travels between Mecca and Medina, Iraq, and Egypt. After Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentioned that his statements in creed will never change, he goes on to mention one of the, one of the important issues related to the correct creed and code of beliefs for the Muslims. حُبُّ الصَّحَابَةِ كُلِّهِمْ لِي مَذْهَبٌ وَمُوَدَّةُ الْقُرْبَى بِهَا أَتَوَسَّلُوا Love of all of the companions is my madhab, and loving the relatives of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam is how I seek closeness to Allah Azza wa Jal. So the question, why did Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah start 
mentioning the issues of creed with mentioning love of the companions. Huh? Refutation to the Shia and also refutation to the Khawarij, the first two sects that emerged. So it, it was as if the tartib that Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah wanted to start yeah. off with was mentioning the biggest doubt that the Khawarij and the Shia have and clarifying what is the madhab of Ahl sunnah first and foremost and laying down the ground, the foundation of what's going to come. As, as if he mentioned the tartib of the masail, the tartib of the issues, based upon the emergence of the different sects that emerged, subhanAllah. And another thing that Brother Buhayra mentioned as well, is that love of the companions, honoring the companions, respecting the companions, believing that Allah was pleased with them, and they were pleased with Allah, that they are the best of people after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa It is haram to talk bad about them, to think bad about them, to speak bad about them, as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, told us. And what is the reason why the, some of those sects that emerged slander and talk about the companions and say that the companions apostated? What is the goal? What is the end goal? They want to cut off the link between us and between the Qur'an and between the Sunnah. If they cut off the link between us, the what? The Isnad, the chain of narration, that which connects us to our teachers, back to their teachers, back to the Tabi'een, back to the companions, back to the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. then our connection is cut to Allah and cut to the Messenger, cut from the Sunnah and cut from the Qur'an. So, they don't say outwardly that, hey, this is what we're doing, why we're slandering the companions, but this is the goal and intention behind it. Because if they cut the link between you and the companions, they can cut the link between you and the Qur'an. They can cut the link between you and the Sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Naam. Commentary. In this line of poetry, Shaykh al-Islam is clarifying that his creed is the creed of Ahl al-Sunnah wa jama'ah in regards to the companions. He loves all of the companions. This is an aspect of creed that every Muslim should know by necessity and understand clearly. A true Muslim loves all of the companions, all of their deeds, statements, and beliefs. Loving them, honoring them, respecting them, defending them, never speaking bad about them, is from the basic fundamentals of Iman and mentioned extensively throughout the Quran and Sunnah. This is something that the main body of Muslims have agreed upon, and only those who have gone astray have disagreed with this. This is what Ahl Sunnah, this is what Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'a have unanimously agreed upon and have conveyed generation after generation, speaking bad about any of the companions, disrespecting them and or slandering them is from the signs of ignorance, kufr, nifaq, hypocrisy, and disbelief in the Quran, Sunnah, and consensus of the scholars, the consensus of the four Imams and the main body of Muslims. What is a companion? A companion is anyone who met the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while awake or alive, believing in him and died upon that belief. What is obligatory upon a Muslim to believe about the companions? It is obligatory upon a Muslim to believe that the companions are the best of the people after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The reason for this is because they learned, memorized, acted upon, and conveyed the Qur'an and Sunnah to the Tabi'een. And they were also mentioned specifically in the Qur'an. In many different surahs. In many different surahs in the Qur'an. And they're mentioned in the footnote of the next page, page 107. Those verses from the Qur'an. They fought jihad side by side with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they sacrificed their wealth, their families, their time, their efforts, and everything they owned to further the cause of Islam. <clears throat> to defend the Quran and defend the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam without them, after Allah, the Quran and Sunnah would never have reached us today. Allah praises them in numerous verses in the Quran, so therefore it is not permissible for anyone to, to, to speak about them in a negative manner. Uh, we're going to pause here uh, because it is time to call the event. And uh, 
as you all can see, my voice and my energy is fading. So we're going to make an attempt to uh, refresh ourselves, inshallah ta'ala. Um, hmm? No, you can't read it. Can't read it. Uh, we're going to fight. Yeah, fight the power. He can't read those shit. Huh? He can't read. He can't read, huh? He can't read. So, so 107 pages, uh, read straight today, huh? Allah, <laughs> Allah, <laughs> Allah, 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 Allah